Uh, okay, so if we don't have any of those folks, I'll just start with Patrick's question, just because I think it's something a lot of people ask, and it's a good question. His question was, wondering if I could get you to talk about setting up a project to run unattended, different considerations for booting and restarting windows and Mac builds, initialization scripts, you know, whether it's bash, git pull, TD prep files, et cetera, integrating stalker, et cetera. Also considerations for offline build as well. So there's a bunch of things that I do that are pretty common. Some of them are a little less common and some of them are just preference. So the first thing is I just go through like all, so first thing is use Windows, please dear God, just like use Windows. I, I mean, you can use the Mac build if you want, if you have to, but you're probably just gonna have a better time using Windows overall. Uh, use Windows 10 LTSC is what it's called now. And I believe the latest version is 2019. You could get, I, if you haven't seen my hilarious explorations of how to buy it, you can get them off eBay for like 10 or 20 bucks. Uh, pretty sure I got a blog post. Uh, let us find out. It's highly worth getting this version of Windows because one, it comes without all of the bloated, it doesn't come with Candy Crush on it. Like, thank Christ. Like, who, who's buying Windows that's like, oh, thanks Windows for installing Candy Crush ahead of time. Really jonesing for Candy Crush. Uh, so it gets rid of all that. Uh, it also allows you, unlike any of the newer Windows 10s, uh, here it is, gray market Windows 10 LTSB. So it used to be called LTSB, but this year they changed the name to be LTSC. Uh, and I talk about how I buy it off eBay for like 10 bucks. And it, I should say, this is legal. This is not like some, this is not like a cracked shenanigans. Uh, essentially what happens is Windows, or Microsoft usually sells this version of Windows only to enterprises in like large quantities. So the ones on eBay's are usually either runoffs from like big Chinese corporations or like other corps who just have like so many LTSC licenses that they just hawk them on uh, eBay for like 10 or 20 bucks a piece. Uh, actually my Windows laptop that we're doing this LTSC. So like I said, it, it comes minus all the bloat. Uh, it actually allows you to turn off automatic updates the updates that it does have, if you leave automatic updates on, are all just security related. So it's not going to be crazy new features or changing like game mode or adding like a new version of paint or anything like none of those things sneak through and like mess up your system. Um, so you can almost even leave the automatic updates on because they're just like security based stuff. Um, so that's a highly a good thing I, I really recommend doing. Uh, I put some remote access software on the machine, just so that like in the off chance you need to get into it. Uh, lately, I've been using AnyDesk. Uh, I used to use TeamViewer, but like, I hate Team, those guys are the worst. How many times do those pop-ups come up over your touch designer window? Even when you already bought the thing, like just leave me alone, people. And then now they're part of like that whole log me in shenanigans. Like I, I'm done with those, with those clowns. Uh, so AnyDesk, I like a lot. Um, there are some other open source alternatives, I think like ZeroDesk or some other shenanigans. Um, in terms of Windows settings, just like turn off all the notifications, uninstall software that you don't need. Uh, Watch Out actually put out a really great article on how to tune Windows. Windows, let me see if I can find it real quick. Ah, yes, it's called, let me share my screen. It's called the Watch Out Windows 10 Tweaking Guide. And it goes through, so they go through the Enterprise Edition, because I guess maybe it's a little bit easier to buy the Enterprise Edition than the LTSC, how to add or remove stuff, group policies, lots of good stuff in there. So I'd highly recommend that. Yeah, I think you just got to give them your email, like it's a free download. And I think even if I remember correctly, Richard Burns posted it on the Discord. So if you don't want to give them your email, maybe just search for Windows 10 Tweaking Guide on there. Then I would check out the, you know, that creating flawless installation workshop that I have, the video training, uh, that'll help you set up your NVIDIA settings and do a few other Windows tweaks, like setting up game mode and stuff like that. Then I would also keep a full backup of everything. Like 
not just, oh, I have all the files somewhere, but like when the project is done and you're leaving, just copy all of the folder structures and everything and just move it onto an external drive you can take with you just so that in case like the drive fails and you got to replace it, you're not trying to like recreate file structure from like eight months ago. Save yourself the trouble on that. I'm a big proponent of having uh, spare backup machines. So like when you're going out and specking these installations and putting together the budget, just budget two computers. It'll save yourself a lot of trouble because often what happens is computers. So here's the thing. I got this. Computers fail right as hardware changes like generation. So like your computer will fail as the graphics card you have is like not easy to buy anymore. That's happened so many times to me where they didn't buy a backup. The thing failed. They're like, oh, well, we can't get the same thing we used to have. So now we have to like change a bunch of stuff. Then you have to go and make sure it works on the newer hardware. Maybe you got to update stuff, blah, blah, blah. Just buy the clone of that machine like right then and there. Uh, it can be a hot backup, which is usually like plugged in on ready to go if, in case you need to like hot swap it. They also have cold backups, which are basically just like the machine is racked, but it's off. So cold. Uh, I would also say use, I use the Windows task scheduler for scheduling things like nightly reboots. I'm a big fan of nightly reboots. I know lots of people like to like keep their computer on forever, but we all know that's not, computers don't like that. And especially ones that are running like crazy touch designer projects, leaving them on forever is like not how you have a stable situation. So don't be afraid like at three in the morning, four in the morning, just boot the system, restart everything. No problems. Uh, so I was saying I use the Windows task scheduler for stuff like that. There's lots of tutorials you can find online. I use the Windows task scheduler also when the computer starts up, but I don't use the Windows task scheduler to start the apps. I use Windows task scheduler to start a batch file and you can learn about Windows batch files uh, just on a web search, but they're essentially just like a little script where you say, okay, start this application and this project file you know, pause for 20 seconds while it loads up, then start this thing. And you can put little like timers and delays. Uh, so batch files are how I manage the startup. Make sure you document what you're doing because in like eight or nine months, if you have to redo it, you're not going to remember. Set up a process watcher. So we have in our toolkit stalker, which is uh, also built in touch designer. And it's pretty good at, at kind of watching a bunch of touch designer projects and then just firing off some emails using SendGrid if something goes wrong. Also, so depending on the client, you may have like battles with security because if you're going into like a client who has like a lot of sensitive data and then you're like, can I get internet, please? They're going to be like, nah. So be prepared to tell them, oh, we have Windows 10 LTSC. It gets regular security updates. We have a firewall on, you know, go through all the things that they want of you because, you know, they're trying to protect their system from somebody hacking your machine and then all of a sudden get like network access on their thing. So be prepared to do like little security things that'll make IT happy. And then last but not least, for unattended things, sign your SLA before you leave the job site. Even I've made this mistake and I have recently and I don't do it anymore. Don't even be forgiving about it. Just make them sign the SLA before you leave. And if you don't know what an SLA is, uh, I've written some blog posts about it, but it's basically just your service level agreement. And what that means is it's basically like the insurance that they buy for you to kind of watch the system and just make sure it works. And if something doesn't work, then you can, you know, remedy it without having to do a whole nother round of like, well, how long do you think it's going to take? Hmm, I think it'll take two days to fix. Hmm, what does two days cost? And like, you don't have to go through all that back and forth, which is going to take like a week and a half. And then like the installation has been down for a while. Uh, I think if you search on Elber's IO, you will find... What is an SLA? Look at that. Beauty. So read this. This is a good one. Uh, you always want to sign this because most of the time your work contract will have a clause that says it needs to be stable for like 30 days after you leave. And that's good. Or 30. Sometimes they go to 90 if they're like real sticklers. But like 30, it, if it's stable for 30 days, it's stable. Like let's let's be real here. So then you want your SLA to kick in after that, which basically says, okay, well, from, for, from 30 days to the, the next year, you know, one year later, if something goes wrong, you've already prepaid us, you know, a couple thousand or a small percentage of the original project fee. We'll log in, we'll fix anything that happens. We can make small tweaks for you. If we hear about some kind of like API update or something, we'll, we'll go ahead and just do it 
so that the, the machine doesn't experience downtime when all of a sudden it can't pull from Twitter or Instagram or something like that. So SLAs, I'm a big fan. And so the reason I say sign them before you leave is because if you don't get their goddamn signature on that paper before you leave, the next time you hear from them will be when it's already broken and they're like, hey, can you fix it? And then you're going to have to either choose to be like, hey, well, guess who didn't sign the SLA? Or you're going to have to be like, yeah, we'll fix it. Like, please sign the SLA. And then they're not going to sign it. They're just going to want you to fix it. So sign the SLA before you leave. You know, buy insurance before you get in the accident. That's what you should tell them. Pretty common stuff, but hilariously difficult to make happen in real life. So that's my, uh, Patrick, that's for you and for everyone else.